Hello. Uh, welcome to the Umtombo Lecture Series hosted by the School of Human and Community Development at the University of the Witwatersrand. I'm Kay Cockroft, Professor in the Department of Psychology. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our visiting scholar, Dr. Samantha Brooks. <clears throat> We're not visiting us, uh, Dr. Brooks is a reader of neuroscience at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. And she's also a chartered member of the British Psychological Society. No stranger to South Africa, uh, Dr. Brooks worked as a lecturer for six years at the University of Cape Town, where she co-led the Psychiatry Neuroimaging Group. Prior to that, she was a postdoc at Uppsala University, Sweden, where she examined the brain processes underlying eating disorders. Dr. Brooks gained her PhD at King's College, London, and her work focuses on the neural mechanisms of impulse control in psychiatric conditions and she has published over 90 papers in high impact journals. Many years of collaboration in the United Kingdom, Sweden and South Africa has contributed to an understanding of the neural processes of appetite and impulse control. And in today's talk, Dr. Brooks will summarize milestones in this collaborative research with brain, image, brain imaging and neurocognitive data from a range of different populations including eating disorders, addiction, and most recently, in people during the COVID lockdown. I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. Brooks, Brooks's talk today, entitled 15 Years of Research into the Neural Processes of Appetite Control. What can brain imaging teach us about improving our habits? Over to you, Dr. Brooks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cockcroft. Uh, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'll just share my screen with you all now. Uh, please let me know if you can't hear me. Okay, so um, today, uh, as Professor Cockcroft said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the collective research uh, that we have done over the last 15 years to understand uh, the processes, the brain processes of appetite control and how this can uh, help us going forward uh, in today's society. Um, so the, the outline of my talk, uh, we're going to be talking about, or I'm going to be telling you about the um, subliminal processes that we've done, uh, that, that we have uh, been examining uh, and how they, uh, how they interfere with uh, working memory processes. Uh, and how we progress this work to look at the, uh, the neural processes of this uh, interaction uh, and the work that we did at the Maudsley Hospital in London. Uh, and following that, the work that we looked at in uh, Sweden, where we examined the uh, early risk factors of anorexia and excessive appetite control in adolescence pre-starvation. So, you know, when the brain is starved, uh, it, it actually uh, diminishes in volume. And then from, uh, from that work that we did in Sweden, uh, we, we, we um, applied this knowledge of neural processes of appetite control uh, to examine uh, how we can apply this uh, to people with uh, addiction. So, you know, deficits in appetite control. And then after the work that we did in South Africa, uh, we, I've come back now to, to uh, the UK, and we are now trying to develop interventions to help improve uh, addiction processes and people that have uh, impulse control problems, particularly during the times of COVID. Um, so I just want to uh, get you to think about first before I start going through the data and there's quite a lot of data in this talk today um, so hopefully it'll be quite interesting um, to apply the data to, to the knowledge that we have. Um, and uh, so I just want you to think about why are appetite and eating disorders linked to impulse control and why you know they link to addiction and these responses that people have, uh, have had uh, in the last year or two uh, to the COVID um, lockdown. So that you know, there's been a lot of impulsivity that we've seen, people resisting uh, lockdown measures uh, and, and also people accepting them quite, quite readily. Uh, so keep that in mind while we go through the talk. 
And uh, this is just sort of a visual illustration of what we mean by impulse control. Some funny pictures here, a little bit outdated now with uh, Trump and, uh, and the uh, president of, of China. Uh, but still, nonetheless, it's quite interesting to see how people posturing, you know, um, how people are using sort of this impulsive behaviour, uh, most particularly in sort of binge eating behaviours and Black Friday. You can see there at the bottom where people just uh, don't really consider um, future thinking. They just want the immediate reward right now. They don't care whether they're violent to people, whether um, they damage, they hurt themselves or others. They just want that reward immediately. Um, and so, you know, this is what we see in the behaviour, and of course this can be a, a, um, uh, measured in brain processes. And if you contrast that with this picture, so these are some, uh, some favourite images that I found of people sort of contemplating, you know, considering, thinking ahead, not really uh, thinking about immediate reward, but planning their behaviour for the future. You have Rodin's The Thinker, uh, it really uh, typifies this, uh, this prefrontal system where we're using our planning behaviours to think ahead uh, and put ourselves in future scenarios. So these are the, the, the um, neural processes that we've been interested in over the years to try and sort of pinpoint and, and to try and strengthen them in, in people that are, are struggling. And two of the most important uh, models of impulse control are uh, these two that we've sort of been uh, focusing our, our research on over the years. And um, Everett, so Barrett, um, uh, uh, Everett from, from Cambridge, and then we wrote a paper a few years ago in Sweden looking at um, a model of uh, eating disorders. So I'll just quickly explain what they mean. So on the left hand side here, the Everett model, this is the um, vulnerability to develop impulsivity. Uh, and it's sort of a spiral, a downward spiral that gets worse. So you start off at the top here where you have a, a vulnerability to impulsivity. So you might you know, be a novelty seeker, which is sort of synonymous with impulsivity. Uh, and you're more prone to anxiety. So you have this sort of genetic link uh, vulnerability to uh, impulsive behaviour. And then you might uh, engage in uh, self-administration of drugs, but only about one in 10 people really uh, become uh, full-blown uh, addicts. Um, so, you know, so a lot of people will, will, will dabble in these sort of drug-taking behaviours. Um, but then if, if it happens over, over time, then you start to get a cognitive impairment, which is related to prefrontal cortex damage. Uh, and the, the, the drug use is still controlled, but then you're starting to see deficits in um, planning ahead behaviour and goal oriented uh, thoughts. And then it, it, behaviour becomes uh, habitual. And uh, this really does reflect a switch from uh, whatever it talks about in his paper from ventral straital activation to dorsal straital, straital processing. So when you start to experience habits and you can't uh, control your impulsive behaviour anymore and you start to take more and more of it, uh, you, you experience um, this habituation and um, you, uh, a person with addiction will then start to have this executive control failure which incorporates working memory and then uh, you, know, you may try and engage in withdrawal uh, in, um, in uh, um, abstinence but then the, the executive control system is so weakened that relapse is, is common. So there's this downward spiral, which is uh, reflected in brain processes. This is a very good paper by Everett, uh, in, in this switch between um, ventral stratum, nucleus accumbens processing, uh, to dorsal stratum processing, which uh, um, uh, um, reflects uh, um, uh, uh, habitual behavior. Uh, and then on the other side, so linking uh, addiction to eating disorders, uh, um, you know, it's a similar process. So you have sort of an arousal uh, mechanism here. Um, uh, so people that are prone to a high state of arousal and anxiety. But the difference here in terms of eating disorders, and you might think, uh, and you're quite right in thinking, that binge eating disorder and bulimia is more related to addictive processes. Um, but you can really separate out the two sort of brain processes of, of binge eating and bulimia on the left hand side here from uh, anorexia uh, and restrictive eating on, uh, on the other side. And the difference is that, um, and we found this in, in brain imaging studies, uh, not just ours, but quite you know, other people in the field, 
that the, the anxiety is sort of um, much more felt uh, in those people that have bulimic-like uh, subtypes. Uh, um, it incorporates a part of the brain called the insula, and this really reflects impulsive behavior. So, you know, you're not able, so this sort of uh, embodied process, uh, straight or uh, insular processing, sort of floods that prefrontal executive control system and leads to sort of an impulsive uh, phenotype. And conversely, on the, on the other side, uh, um, with people that are more restrictive in their, um, in their, in their subtype, uh, this anxiety will sort of hijack the belief systems, the medial prefrontal systems, and become sort of ruminatory in nature. So it becomes a compulsive uh, uh, phenotype, so obsessive compulsive disorder. And obsessive compulsive disorder is comorbid often uh, with severe anorexia and restrictive behavior, uh, whereas more sort of um, promiscuous and uh, risk, um, uh, you know, uh, novelty seeking behaviors tend to coincide with binge eating behavior. So there's much more lack of control of behavior on the impulsive, what we call the bottom up side, which is really um, about uh, these bodily sensations. And then the top down side is more about sort of a prefrontal or compulsive uh, uh, type um, uh, behaviors. Um, so, th so this sort of links the two models together. So this is sort of what's been uh, shaping our research over the last 15 years. And then there's another uh, model here that I want you to think about uh, before I go on to the data. So these are sort of um, uh, models of prediction of impulsive behavior. Um, and it looks quite complicated, but it's not uh, really. Uh, I'll just quickly go through it with you, um, just to say that there's different pathways to risky behavior. So it's not just a case of, you know, people are impulsive, that's that. There's lots of different uh, um, uh, cognitive um, strategies and behavioral strategies that, that, that eventually lead to this risky behavior. And the, this first pathway is, is obviously the impulsive path, pathway um, specific um, arousal processes lead to a specific um, risky behavior. So uh, if, if you're aroused, if you're taking certain drugs, if you've got an impulsive vulnerability, or if you're fearful, if you're already in a state of, of arousal, whether it be fear or, 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 you know, because of drugs, then you're more likely to engage in risky behavior. That's quite, quite obvious. Um, and then of course, there's a second uh, pathway uh, which incorporates, so you have a risky situation, uh, but then you can reflect on it like the Rodin's Thinker uh, slide, and you can then activate, so long as you haven't damaged your prefrontal system with, with stimulant drugs, for example, or as, as long as you're not highly stressed at that particular time, you can employ this top-down control, uh, utilizing working memory processes to inhibit or to at least moderate your um, impulsive behavior. And that then lowers the chances of risky behavior. And then of course, pathway C uh, uh, incorporates moderation of uh, your impulsive behaviors. And this reflects boundary conditions. So I sort of touched on it earlier. Uh, if you've got, if, you're, if, you've, if you've drunk alcohol or if you're in, a, in, a, in an extreme mood state, if you're stressed, then your physiology is going to be in such a um, in such a state that uh, these are going to affect your ability to engage these um, reflective processes. So the, the, the control is there, but it can be moderated by fluctuations or variations in the environment. And that's important. These things all sound quite obvious, um, but the flexibility that people are able to in, uh, um, employ uh, in their reflective control processes can vary from day to day and from moment to moment. So, and it may tell us something about, for example, how people have responded to the COVID pandemic or how they respond to stressful situations at, on any given day. Um, <clears throat> this reflection process, which we've uh, mentioned, uh, again, uh, you know, incorporates these working memory uh, processes. Uh, and reflection means allowing, uh, being able to hold in mind uh, for a delayed time, these cognitions that you can then uh, compare them to what you want to uh, achieve in the future. So it's a delayed process. Uh, Goldman Rackett did quite a lot of work on working memory delay processes in, in monkeys, in rhesus monkeys, macaque monkeys as well. And, um, you know, this 
the, what they found with single unit recording of neurons is that you know these uh, GABAergic glutamatergic neurons actually fire in the absence of external stimuli. So it's the ability of your prefrontal system to rem to continue firing in the absence of um, in the absence of um, uh, uh, external stimulation. And the idea that that really is the pivot of the research that we're doing, because if we can strengthen those neural circuits uh, and or change their physiology at the circuit level. Uh, we're more likely to uh, promote that ability to hold, you know, to keep that delayed stimulation going in the absence of external stimuli. Uh, and then this rational pathway, which really uh, links to uh, reflective processes, really, so sort of similar. Uh, this is um, uh, whether it's, you know, because sometimes it's it, it's okay to take risks. So is it uh, a, a good idea if you weigh up the subsequent? Um, uh, outcome is it a good idea to take that risk um, uh, in, in the moment uh, and of course that relates to moral decision making so you know is it better to have this risk uh, and avoid a, a greater risk in the future and to be able to do that sort of moral reasoning that sort of logical reasoning you have to be able to um, hold in mind those alternative outcomes uh, without being um, uh, uh, um, disturbed by the immediate stimulation and then uh, this trait impulsivity at the end is what we mentioned in the previous slide, where if you've got a genetic predis predisposition to impulsivity, you, you've got a, you've got a, a harder job really to um, to activate those control processes to enable you um, to control them. But it's not impossible. And again, pro probably the well, hopefully the intervention that we're developing will allow people that have got trait impulsivity to exercise greater control uh, in, the, in, in the future. Um, and of course, similarly, there's this trait sensation seeking as well, which is which is related to uh, trait impulsivity. It's this like looking for, um, you know, so people that go mountain climbing or uh, jump out of planes and things, th this need to uh, engage in uh, in these sort of um, error detection uh, activities uh, is also uh, possibly a, a trait um, vulnerability. Okay, so as I said, we focus on these reflective processes and how to control them, because you can quite clearly see there that in this rather complicated looking model, uh, and this paper is very useful uh, to, to further understand this model, uh, reflective processes really are central to um, developing a, a better control of, of risky and impulsive behavior. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the collective work that has gone on uh, in the last sort of 10, 15 years that have um, really enabled us to uh, develop now a new uh, intervention that's been sort of in the pipeline for the last, well, since um, around about 2015 in South Africa. And um, it really is quite exciting because it brings together all of this uh, eclectic research uh, and strengthens the notion that we can possibly uh, change brain uh, structure and function uh, to improve uh, impulse control. And um, this was actually a model from my PhD uh, where we were able, and it was quite new research, this was back in 2010, uh, we were able to map certain um, brain areas, so prefrontal cortex, um, lateral and medial, anterior cingulate cortex, these were really predominantly activated when people were restricting their behaviour. Uh, and genetic markers as well uh, to indicate, you know, how well people um, or, or how well brain uh, circuits uh, catabolize dopamine. And that has got something to do with uh, working memory processes. Uh, serotonergic processes, of course, for that anxiety angle. As you can see here, anxiety figures on both sides of this spectrum. So if it's imbalanced, if you've got too much restriction on the one side or if you've got too much impulsivity on the other, then you're going to experience anxiety. But Remember back to that two-pronged model of eating disorders, uh, that uh, the impulsive side, the binging side is more sort of bottom-up processes, striatal. So here we've got striatal amygdala, basal ganglia processes. Uh, whereas on this side, um, it's more obsessive compulsive processes and uh, you know, excessive top-down control. 
Um, so this has been the model, and it's always good to use a parametric approach when you're uh, you know, designing experiments and testing your theory, uh, because you can always then try and pin it on to this model and refute it as well uh, if it doesn't quite fit and, and then update your model. So we have updated the model over the years. It's not as simple as this, unfortunately. I mean, of course, there's prob probably other dimensions to this model, like impulsivity versus compulsivity and different um, uh, personality traits, for example, may affect uh, where you fall on this line. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go through some of the data then. So the first work that we did uh, with when I was a master's student with my colleagues at King's was um, we looked at unconscious neural processes. And this is really interesting because if you, of course, ask somebody with an eating disorder what they think about food, uh, they're, they're either going to tell you the truth or they're going to tell, tell a lie to maybe, uh, not because they're bad people, but because they either want to, um, you know, uh, improve your experiment or, or jeopardize it, you know. So if you ask people outright what they, what they think, often uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, reflect what's going on in their brains. So uh, we wanted to understand those uh, reward processes in the absence of this uh, cognitive bias that they might have. Um, so we, uh, we, in a series of experiments that I'm going to briefly describe to you now, we showed um, disease salient stimuli, so food images, of course, high calorie food images, and we con contrasted them with uh, images, subliminal images of um, uh, aversive pictures, so, you know, horrible bloody scenes, and then neutral images. And we wanted to see if this impinges on their working memory, which, as I said in the previous slides, is quite a central component of this reflective process. So could we disturb their working memory system? Is working memory a central component of appetite control or is it something else? And in these studies, um, we, we did this uh, using a working memory task called the NBAC task. And we also did this in another task um, called uh, the Bonogo task. And the reason that we use two tasks is because the working memory activates lateral prefrontal processes, so lateral prefrontal processes, and the um, Gonogo task typically activates medial processes. So you can distinguish between different aspects of the prefrontal cortex. Um, so this was the first paper that we did in this, uh, in this uh, series of studies. Um, this was the next one. Um, and uh, this was the, the final one that we did. So we, uh, and we've published other subliminal studies since then too. And in this first study, uh, this uh, table here represents the e easier version of the MBAC task, the one back. And this represents the uh, slightly more difficult two back task. I mean, it's still doable, uh, but it's, it becomes more difficult. And in the white uh, bars, you can see uh, these are health controls. And in the black bars, these are anorexic patients, so uh, restricting anorexic patients. And when it's easy, you know, they pretty much uh, perform in the same way. But when it's more difficult, then, of course, obviously, in both groups, you're going to start to see more errors creep in. But what was interesting here is that um, when it was uh, subliminal stimulation, uh, the uh, you know when they weren't uh, conscious of it, the it seemed that the um, uh, the anorexic patients were not really affected. But I mean, obviously they're making more errors because the task was harder. But they were making less errors than the healthy controls. So they were less affected by these subliminal images. And just to point out here in this first study, we didn't differentiate between the type of uh, stimuli. We just uh, randomly uh, presented subliminal images of food aversive and neutral so at this point we were just bluntly looking to see whether subliminal images interfered with their uh, cognitive performance and of course when it was supraliminal which means they can see those images we were showing these images during the the, the end back task they were less likely that they were less able to uh, concentrate on the task so that that's you know probably quite obvious if you show images um these people with, with, with anorexia, particularly the food images, they weren't able to ignore. So that told us something. That told us that perhaps, you know, this working memory process, which the MBAC task utilizes, is the underlying um, mechanism that they uh, use to suppress at least bodily responses uh, to food images that are activated, even though you're not consciously aware of these, of these images. Um, but it didn't tell us anything about how they respond to food images that are presented subliminally. 
So uh, we did this next, uh, actually. So we separated out the task, uh, the images, and we showed blocks of uh, subliminal food images, high calorie food images, uh, aversive images, and neutral images that were masked with this backward design, this uh, mosaic effect, which basically you can still see the food image if it's presented at 23 milliseconds. But um, if you then disrupt the flow from the retina to the visual cortex with this um, subsequent uh, image with the letter, the target letter or the source letter presented on this uh, mosaic effect, then it disturbs the processing uh, um, of that image. This is a well-known uh, uh, paradigm uh, in subliminal uh, um, experiments. Um, and these were just some of the images that we used. So we deliberately, so we had food, aversive and neutral. These objects were the examples of neutral. And as you can see, we carefully, painstakingly matched them to look a bit like food uh, so that it wasn't the visual uh, stimulation that led to the disturbance. It was the actual emotional content of the, of the images that they, they were processing. So their brains were still processing these images. Uh, but they just weren't conscious of them. I haven't shown the aversive images because they're quite disgusting. So I wanted to save you from that today. Uh, and apologies for the slight uh, blurring of this image, um, but what we found, so again, as a reminder, we did this in two um, studies. We first of all did it in the working memory end back task, which activates the lateral parts of the prefrontal cortex. And then we did it in the, um, go no go task which activates medial aspects of the prefrontal cortex so medial versus lateral we wanted to see whether this interfered just generally in the prefrontal or whether a specific brain region and i'll just tell you now that in the go no go task there was no interference effect so it had no effect uh, in the in the medial uh, uh, task that we used but in the go no go in, in the um sorry working memory task in the lateral task we, uh, we saw this, um, this, this disturbance effect. And what we found was that subliminal aversive and neutral images didn't significantly uh, disturb the working memory performance on patients, but the food images did. So, um, so here we can see, so what, what you're seeing here is that's actually in the wrong place. I do apologize, that should be over the food images. Uh, or the food bar, uh, but um, here we see that the uh, in the black uh, bars, these are the anorexic patients, and the, 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 the grey bars are the healthy controls, and these are mean errors. So in the aversive condition, the working memory task, um, and we, we looked at this in the two-back task, um, the uh, patients were making far few errors, significantly fewer errors, and the same applied in the neutral. So they weren't affected by the aversive or the neutral, but then they um, lost their superior performance. So they started, the, the errors started to creep up in the anorexic women when they were looking at food. And again, bearing in mind, these um, images were closely matched to the neutral and the anorexic patients and the health controls were not aware of, um, of these images. Um, so what was also interesting is that um, in the other paper that I haven't included uh, any figures on uh, for um, purposes of time, uh, we found that increasing that working memory load, so, you know, I just mentioned that this was in two back, but if we increased it to three back or four back, uh, the working memory load prevented that, um, that subliminal interference in healthy controls. So, um, so we can actually prevent those, uh, those errors if you are uh, you know, concentrating more on the task. And this is known in other literature, for example, the pain literature. If you put your hand in a cold bucket, some of my colleagues are doing this at, at John Moore's, it's called the cold press, and it's a really cold bucket of ice and you're trying to do a task. If you're doing an easy task, you feel the pain. Uh, but if you're doing a harder task, then you don't feel those uh, bodily responses. So the same thing applies here, really. If you can activate, if you can keep that prefrontal working memory system active and strengthen it, you're less interfered by uh, external distractions. Um, so then we progressed this a little bit further uh, and we looked, we, you know, so they were all neuropsych studies. So then we wanted to look at the brain basis of these uh, findings. And this uh, co uh, contributed to some of my PhD work. Um, these are some of the papers that come out uh, of that work, looking at the um, neural processes of this, um, this top-down control. Uh, and the first paper that we, that we published uh, looking at this um, phenomenon was 
uh, uh, a study uh, of cognitive bias to food images. And we actually, um, so this isn't a, a, a brain imaging study, but it, 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 um, it tells us something that we wanted to look at in the, in the brain imaging studies. Um, and what this was, was a meta-analysis of responses during the Stroop task, the food Stroop task. And in this middle bar, this represents no effect. And on the left-hand side, this re represents a quick response to um, uh, food words, you're naming the ink color of the food words. And on the right-hand side, uh, this reflects um, slow, uh, slower responses, uh, which is indicative of you know, um, more labored cognitive processing. Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, uh, the people with anorexia were um, really, um, so this, these are all anorexic studies and they were all um, slower than the uh, healthy control. So we could see here that there was something across all of the studies that looked at this cognitive bias, there was something going on uh, in these, um, in the brains of these, uh, of these uh, participants who had eating disorders, so anorexia, bulimia, and eating disorders that were not really specified. Um, and so uh, with this in mind, uh, with this excessive or um, extra cognitive processing that we saw in this, uh, in this paper that's one of uh, my most highly cited papers, um, with that in mind, we wanted to see, well, what's going on in the brain? So if you use it more, if, you're, if, if, if this uh, working, let's say if your working memory system is ruminating all the time on food images, does it change the, the brain volume uh, in, in these people with anorexia in, in their brain. So a bit like going to the gym, if you're using that muscle all the time, does it look bigger? And the problem, the confound in, in people with anorexia is that of course, when they're starved, generally their whole brain shrinks because of nutritional um, you know, starvation effects. So you have to be really clever in trying to uh, tease out some of the potentially larger brain volumes that you might find in people with anorexia. And we were very lucky, we actually did in this paper in 2012, find that compared to healthy controls, uh, this region of the brain, which is uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, was larger, it's left uh, DLPFC, was, was uh, significantly larger in volume than the healthy controls. Uh, in actual fact, it's, it's not quite so simple as that. What we found was that over time, the age match control women uh, between the ages of 18 to 45 um, they had a normal, and uh, sadly it is normal, uh, age-related atrophy in this brain region, right? So as you get older, this uh, just naturally diminishes. But in the women with anorexia, there wasn't this age-related decline. So something that they're doing, something that they're using their brain for is saving them, you could say, from this age-related atrophy. Uh, and when we looked at this a little bit further, we found that um, this brain region, uh, so in general, they do have smaller brains, but uh, this uh, DLPFC region was correlating with the amount of restraint, cognitive restraint that they were uh, exercising. So you could say from this paper that this demonstrates that um, obsessive compulsive uh, working memory type cognitions keeps your brain larger to a certain extent, you could say. Uh, in the DLPFC region. Uh, other data that we found, so remember that this brain region connects, you know, there's a, there's a white matter tract, quite a, quite a large one, uh, you know, which you can think of in terms of neuroplasticity. Can you strengthen that uh, connectivity between this region and these regions? There's something called the frontostriatal circuitry, which is really prominent in the working memory uh, uh, circuit. You know, so when you're using your working memory to hold in mind a complex cognition about the future and you're dampening down the immediate uh, stimulation in your body of immediate um, you know things going on in your environment you're using this frontostriatal circuitry um, and what we found in this other paper in fact there were two papers that we published out of this fMRI data this is now this was volumetric data uh, brain structural data and this was uh, functional data and here we found that people with anorexia had significantly uh, lower activation in the striatal region. So remember, going back to that Everett model, uh, if you've got more um, habits, if you're more sort of, if you, if you have a more addiction phenotype, then you're going to be activating this um, uh, striatal process. So bulimic patients are perhaps more like uh, uh, um, addiction uh, participants than anorexic patients. And so this probably goes to show that um, the anorexic patients are utilizing this uh, frontal system to dampen this striatal process. 
Um, so remember again, you know, this is going, uh, so this, all this data started around about 2000, well, the studies that contributed to these publications started around about 2002. So if you are early career researchers, don't uh, give up. <laughs> you must keep uh, persevering with your research because over time you will collect a, a nice body of evidence that supports your, your, your theories. Okay, so after that work uh, in, ad in adults, so with chronic anorexia, I was able then to go over to Sweden to work with colleagues uh, looking at adolescents with a new diagnosis of eating disorder. I remember I mentioned that one of the problems with anorexia is this um, starvation effect on the brain. So if you catch people with anorexia at the early stage, there's less damage caused to the brain, and then you can sort of measure uh, cognitive deficits in the absence of the, those starvation confounds. Um, and just briefly going through, because uh, I'm conscious of the time, uh, we did find that people with a, a new diagnosis or, or adolescents with a new diagnosis of anorexia had these obsessive compulsive traits and uh, these were linked to working memory processes and they were as we hypothesized related to this differential prefrontal cortex activation and the insula, which is sort of um, in the vicinity of the temporal cortex and it's linked to bodily sensations. So again, corroborating the view that even when you haven't got this starvation effect, you are suppressing those bodily sensations, uh, you know, by activating, exercising this obsessive compulsive working memory process. Uh, similarly, uh, we looked at um, uh, the structural differences and we did find structural differences in, uh, in those regions. We, we, um, we actually wrote a, a meta-analysis to, to show that they had, as we imagine, reduced brain structure in reward and somatosensory regions. So when you look at all of the VBM voxel-based morphometry studies in uh, anorexia, you find this generally reduced uh, um, uh, brain volume in reward regions for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in terms of uh, other structural studies, so uh, diffusion tensor imaging is a very good modality to look at those white matter tracts. So I mentioned earlier that you know the frontostriatal circuitry is a major white matter tract that's uh, related to working memory processes. And you know you can you can measure uh, white matter to examine sort of neuroplasticity. So over a period of time, do these white matter tracts change? And um, in the sort of limbic uh, uh, thalamic cortical projections, which are sort of the reward uh, uh, emotion network in the brain, and these reward circuitry, uh, these are um, changed in people with with uh, restrictive anorexia too. Uh, this was. Uh, an interesting study because we looked at the opposite side of that spectrum that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, uh, to, you know, to, to show that the, the opposite is true uh, in terms of um, activation to food images in people with obesity. So we looked at all of the fMRI studies in people with obesity and, and a meta-analysis actually is a very good way to pull together all of the studies, particularly if you're waiting to get funding or ethical approval for a study that you want to do. And it's, it's sometimes regarded as a more powerful technique to get the answer in your field instead of just doing a single study. Uh, and so in this particular meta-analysis, we found um, you know, that people with obesity had um, this uh, reduced DLPFC activation uh, among other regions, which uh, suggested that they weren't able to use this working memory process in an efficient way to control their eating behavior. Um, and uh, not only did the functional uh, data show that to be the case in that meta-analysis, we also did a very large um, study of our own uh, in Sweden, looking at the volumetric changes in people with late life obesity. And we found that people that were consistently obese after uh, over a five year period, again, they had these smaller region, regional gray matter in uh, DLPFC um, volume. So uh, again, it, it, it supports the notion that at the other extreme of that spectrum, people that aren't very good at using their working memory have reduced uh, gray matter volume and uh, deficits in their function. Um, and these are just some of the um, uh, images from those studies. I am conscious of the time, so I'm just going to, and you, you, know, you can ask me questions at the end or um, I can send you these papers, but in essence, this showed that in the uh, adolescent anorexic brain, there's this obsessive compulsive network um, that correlated with obsessionality, impulsivity, and eating disorder um, concerns. 
and that they sort of mapped onto this nice um, working memory uh, prefrontal system. And this is just showing the obesity study that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in a, I think it was over 400 um, obese participants who had been consistently lean, and we, we saw that they were worse at the working memory uh, task than their normal weight counterparts. Um, so taking all that information from London and from Sweden, I, I was then able to go down to South Africa um, and apply what we learned about um, you know, the neural processes of appetite control to see if we could um, uh, sort of force people with substance abuse, particularly methamphetamine use disorder, which is a really terrible disorder because it's very difficult to treat a stimulant drug use uh, activates uh, certain dopaminergic processes which are really difficult to tackle pharmacologically or um, with uh, psychological interventions. So I wanted to see if we could, um, you know, give an intervention, a working memory training intervention over four weeks uh, to see if we could change those neural circuits in the frontostracal circuitry and whether this would correspond to improvements in their impulse control. So um, we, uh, you know, so bearing in mind that people with uh, addiction are probably on the opposite side of the spectrum to people with uh, anorexia. Um, and so our first study, uh, we developed, uh, we got um, uh, uh, 10,000 pounds to develop um, this, this app called Kobe Addiction. And we uh, gave meth patients down in, uh, in Cape Town uh, the, the intervention daily for four weeks, uh, excluding weekends. And then we scanned them at baseline and then four weeks later to see if it changed their brain volume and whether it um, you know, changed their behavior. We also looked at the, um, the uh, neuropsych uh, associated with it. So did it change their impulsivity, their self-regulation uh, and their mood as well? Uh, so luckily, uh, we did find, in actual fact, that the working memory trains group, uh, who were compared to the treatment as usual group, they, were the, they had exactly the same inpatient experience, they were eating the same food, they were getting the same treatment, uh, but the only difference was that the uh, working memory trained group had an additional uh, session of um, this, you know, end back task, uh, increasing in level of difficulty. They only got up to, um, I think it was four back in this case, because that's all we had money to develop. Uh, and although uh, it's not really striking on the um, sagittal or coronal uh, slices, you can see here that, and it was significant, it was, it was quite highly significant that the volume, so this is brain volume, was significantly increased in the bilateral basal ganglia which incorporates the stratum in people with methamphetamine. Now, our first um, thought was, well, if you increase methamphetamine, uh, sorry, if you increase a stratal volume, surely that would make you more impulsive. But if you look in the literature, and we have written a paper on this now, uh, summarizing the literature, we find, in fact, that if you've got greater uh, basal ganglia volume, it's, it's, it's um, sort of demonstrating that they have better frontostracal circuitry. So it's a good outcome. In actual facts, and that is what we found. So, in the red line here, we've got um, the treatment as usual group, and in the blue line, it's the working memory trained. And these are just two examples from this uh, from this paper. Uh, at baseline versus follow up, the cognitive trained group had significant. I mean, it doesn't seem like a, a large amount, but it is significant. They had a significant drop in their impulsivity, and uh, certainly in terms of their self-regulation, the uh, working memory training group had a significant rise in their ability to self-regulate after four weeks. Uh, and what's also interesting though, in the left DLPFC, which is sometimes referred to as the middle frontal gyrus, uh, we also found that um, those that had less damage in this brain region, because obviously um, stimulant drugs, including methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, significantly damage uh, chronically uh, prefrontal um, uh, brain volume, so it shrinks it in essence. And what we found was that those that had higher brain volume uh, at baseline in this region, so less damage, uh, did better at the cognitive training. So they had a much stronger delta, uh, a better delta score uh, in the self-regulation um, measures uh, at follow-up. So that's quite an interesting finding there too. Um, and this was just the, uh, so I am coming to the end of the talk now, um, but so this was just the um, a review that we did afterwards. Where I mentioned this uh, to say that a lot of studies have shown increased uh, stratal 
volume and function uh, following working memory training. So this is where we learned that by doing this uh, review. Um, but the reason that we wrote this review as well is because there's a lot of uh, criticism about working memory training in the literature, particularly for this thing called far transfer, that after four weeks or so of daily 15 minute working memory training, does it really change quality of life? Um, and uh, the, the argument of this paper was that, well, you know, there are lots of um, uh, um, contradictory findings in the literature, but that's probably because we're not using the right methods. Uh, we're focusing on things like intelligence or attention, and intelligence is a very difficult construct to, you know, sort of conceptualize. Uh, it's very, you know, what does it mean? Uh, so if you if we if we change the measures that we're using to um, determine whether working memory training is effective or not, in other words, look at brain changes or look at impulse impulsivity measures, which hardly any people anybody in the field are doing at the moment, uh, then we might see uh, differences. Um, and so yeah, this is basically what I've said. The far transfer is is an issue. But uh, brain changes uh, after a course of working memory training in frontoparietal and striatal circuits that often occur prior to behavioral changes. So brain changes often usually occur before they translate eventually into, into behavioral changes. And this might be a better indicator of, of efficacy. So we found in this review that, um, we, and it was a review of uh, brain imaging studies, that repeated working memory training does reduce brain activation. So if you get reduced brain activation, it actually could be uh, an indication of uh, efficiency, uh, but it tends to be um, uh, a U-shaped curve actually. Um, and we also found in this uh, paper that transcranial direct current stimulation and um, quant uh, gene polymorphisms can actually moderate the effects of those, uh, of those um, working memory training studies. Uh, yeah. So um, I just wanted to quickly remind you then that the, the reason that we're doing all this is so that we can strengthen those brain processes that enable us to not only uh, control our, the disturbance uh, to things that we can see, but we're all well aware that our appetite can be stimulated by things that we're not aware of. So um, all of these studies contributed to this um, uh, brain circuitry that, um, you know, you've got this uh, arousal, anxiety, whatever it is, uh, stimulation coming up through the brainstem uh, meets the anterior cingulate, um, sorry, the, uh, yes, the anterior insular cortex, uh, as well as basal ganglia, and it's processed uh, uh, by the uh, anterior cingulate, which is like a gateway to the prefrontal cortex, which then uh, activates, for example, uh, lateral systems that allow uh, cognitive control. And the fusel form gyrus is just for uh, visual processing. And what's interesting about these studies is that you can still activate area V1 of the visual primary visual cortex in the absence of awareness. Um, so all of that combined, and uh, I promise I am coming to the end now, but all of that combined, uh, we are currently in England, not only um, applying this to uh, COVID and all, you know, this has been a major experiment in a way you can, you can say, uh, we've, we've all gone through um, a, a novel situation. So we can look to see how people behave uh, we're not only collecting data on, on those differences in behavior and whether it relates to working memory uh, differences, uh, we're also um, currently developing uh, an app uh, that can uh, help uh, strengthen uh, addiction and eating disorder processes here in, in Liverpool. Uh, so do watch this space. Now, um, the the, the COVID study that we're doing in collaboration with Kate and um, uh, Saba and, and colleagues, uh, we, we um, developed a, or we designed a survey and uh, put it out there last year after the first lockdown or the, you know, the first like uh, during the summer in the UK, but it was a, a global study. And we were very lucky in that uh, over 2000 respondents replied to this um, survey and it was actually based on this King study. So it wasn't a study that we commissioned through King's, but we based the questions on this King study. And what this study found at King's with it was that there were three types of uh, responses to the COVID uh, lockdown. There was a uh, majority of people accepted, so they flexibly updated their behavior uh, to uh, accept the, the rules. 
um, there were um, sufferers who accepted the rules but felt much more anxious about it. And then there were these small minority of resistors who uh, didn't believe in it at all. They avoided um, wearing their masks. They were much more rigid in their, in their um, thinking style. So you could argue that they might be a bit more like restricting anorexic patients who you know, are avoiding um, you know, uh, advice to eat better and, and so on, and, and being very rigid in their, in their thinking style. Um, so uh, what does all this have to do with appetite control? Well, uh, what's very interesting about these three different responses is that they sort of mimic um, this, uh, this well-known phenomenon that uh, when you're young, you have a uh, slightly lower sort of sensation seeking uh, um, vulnerability, which is sort of almost synonymous with impulse, impulsivity, which rises to sort of puberty and then drops again as you get older. And this also represents the uh, maturation of the brain. So the blue areas, the more developed, the red are the less developed. And your prefrontal system doesn't fully develop or hasn't finished developing really. And it's changing dynamically throughout life. Uh, it's not fully developed until about age 20, 25. So that sort of really reflects this ability to control your novelty seeking. And if we look at from this paper uh, from King's, the differences in the accepting, the suffering, the resisting. We can see here that the majority of the acceptors were older, so 55 to 75. So you could argue that that might reflect a fully developed prefrontal system. Uh, the sufferers, on the other hand, were a lot more diffuse. And going back to that quite complicated model that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, uh, you could argue that this could be these moderating boundary conditions that, okay, these people are trying to utilize their prefrontal systems to, you know, accept the changing rules, um, but there are lots of other things going on that might lead to their suffering, suffering being higher levels of anxiety and depression and alcoholism. Um, and then finally, uh, the resistors tended to be, according to this uh, King study, the, the lower end of the age group. So, you know, um, these sort of 16 to 24 year olds. So again, does it reflect this underdeveloped prefrontal system, this inability to uh, quickly change your behavior uh, according to quickly changing rules? So that flexible thinking style is, seems to be key in terms of uh, working memory processes and being able to think ahead and, and um, uh, you know, control your impulsive behavior. Um, so coming to the end now, uh, just to quickly uh, conclude and summarise what I've told you. Um, so in people with chronic, adults with chronic anorexia, there's a successive top-down restraint, avoiding the distraction of non-conscious effective or repetitive stimuli. Um, and these food-related or, 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 or arousing stimuli, they sort of overburden that working memory uh, prefrontal system. And this leads to a cognitive biases that slow down responses, lead to distractibility, impulsivity, and OCD type cognition. So that rumination process uh, in this uh, excessive top-down control phenotype. Um, and people with uh, restricting anorexia, um, you know, tend to have this excessive control of appetite. They're very rigid, they're very stuck in their ways, they resist uh, eating, and they have this dysfunctional interoceptive awareness of their body. Uh, as well. And on the opposite side of that spectrum, we have reduced working memory ability, uh, as, as in the case of people with addiction, uh, and this reflects a reduced uh, uh, lateral prefrontal system, and uh, you know, this frontostracal circuitry is not working efficiently, and grey matter volume is also reduced. Um, and we could potentially, and that's what that, that this is where the work is, is right now, um, strengthen that uh, diminished frontostracal circuitry with repeated and increasingly difficult working memory training. So uh, the literature suggests, and I'm part of a collaboration uh, with the Australian and global colleagues to determine the optimum delivery of working memory training. And uh, it seems to be the case, uh, according to you know, over 100 um, scientists in the field, that about 15 minutes three times a week is, is optimal for encouraging that, that neuro, uh, neuroplasticity. And with this, we might find brain volume increases and uh, we might find at first excessive activation in the DLPFC, but then that decreases over time. So when you first start learning it, you get increased activation, which then diminishes as you become more efficient and master the task. Um, and these uh, COVID impulsive behaviors might be uh, reduced, you know, so we might be able to encourage people to be a bit more 
um, compliant, if that's the right word, uh, you know, by strengthening this working memory uh, network. Uh, yeah, so, and, and also, you know, working memory uh, training has been uh, utilized in people with dementia and people with uh, brain in injury. And there is some good evidence in the field that uh, strengthening those neural networks can actually help to stave off dementia in old age. There are some studies, uh, I can send you the links to those, and also to help people recover from, from brain surgery too. Uh, and just to conclude then, so, you know, this ability to hold negative emotions in mind during uncertainty, especially, uh, and to avoid these risky behaviours, you know, to resist. Uh, so often we engage in risky behaviours like substance abuse, including alcoholism, to resist processing negative emotions. So we flood our bodies, in essence, with uh, these other risky behaviours in a way, you know, typically rewarding, but can be aversive. Uh, um, uh, you know, to avoid these negative emotions. So that includes disordered eating, drug use, alcoholism, aggression and violence, and flouting these lockdown rules. And so my very last slide is coming up now um, to say that, you know, strengthening this working memory network will probably uh, help to expand this window of tolerance. So it um, sounds a bit hippie-ish, but it's actually, there is a, you know, biological substrate of this window of tolerance. Um, this ability to self-regulate, you know, things are only getting harder in the world with climate change and all sorts of uncertainties. So we have to not only, you know, teach ourselves to be better at tolerating, but also change our brain structure to allow us to, to have that um, ability. Um, and this is a very good uh, article to uh, learn a little bit more about that. So I'm going to stop here and um, just to thank the huge amount of people who have been really um, inspiring to me and helped me over the years. Uh, I'll just quickly name them because they are very important people. Helgi Schott, uh, my boss in Sweden, uh, our very own Kate Cockcroft, who's here in the audience, uh, who's, um, who I work with. Uh, I'm very uh, uh, lucky to work with um, the Neural Lab. Uh, Helen Poole, who's my uh, boss, who's actually just been made a professor. Uh, Rhiannon uh, mackenzie Phelan, who's a PhD student, who's been writing some papers with me. Jamie Tully, who's now a senior lecturer at Exeter, who works with um, ketamine use and other addictions. Janet Treasure, who's a dame now, is the um, head of the King's Eating Disorder Unit. Uh, professor Dan Stein, who's the boss of the uh, Department of Psychiatry at UCT. And I think a lot of people know uh, Professor uh, Mark Soames, who's always very inspiring, uh, talking about the unconscious processes and con consciousness uh, in, in the brain. So uh, I will thank you for your um, patience with me, because I did go over slightly, uh, and I hope that you've got some questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Samantha. That, that was a really interesting demonstration of uh, neuroplasticity with such broad applications. Um, so please uh, type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we do have one, I think, a question and a comment that were uh, related. Let me just see if I can find it. So um, Samantha, the question was, in your NCOS model of impulse control, uh, where on the rest restrictive eating side, is, is, this, is the process only triggered by anxiety? So two people, one commented and one asked a question, what about the role of depression, knowing that depression and anxiety are linked? Is, yeah. is there a role played by depression in that uh, kind of that model? Um, I, I was going to try and flick back to the slide, but I can't actually stop my slides. Right? It would take too long to flick all the way back. So. Uh, um, so the question was, is there a role for depression, did you say? So um, that's really a, a good question because anxiety tends to develop into depression, doesn't it? So, you know, Seligman's learned helplessness model. I mean, that's, I think that's quite old, old now. Um, and I'm not a clinician. I must uh, give that caveat. I'm not a clinician. Uh, but, you know, my understanding of depression is that, um, you know, if, if you've if you've come up against lots of, um, you know, sort of what you regard as failures, doesn't necessarily have to be failure uh, because, you know, you've experienced anxiety and not performing the way that you wish you were or sort of thing like this. And then, um, th then you develop a sort of bias towards, um, you know, negative, uh, 
negative thinking and uh, and um, you know the, those ruminations that you uh, sort of really attend to the small detail of um, aspects of your life that um, support that sort of ruminatory process. So I, I would argue, I'm probably not making the <laughs> giving the right answer or the best, most astute answer, but uh, I would I would argue that depression is a form of rumination on the very fine details that corroborate your hypothesis about yourself that you're not doing well, you know, the anxiety uh, that you're um, failing. And so, uh, I mean, of course, people with uh, eating disorders do have high levels of anxiety and depression on the HAD scale, for example, or hospital anxiety and depression scale. Um, and so I think they are, you know, they often correlate with each other, anxiety and depression, when you, when you measure them with these validated measures. So, so I would definitely argue that it's probably, um, you know, a ruminatory process and an attention to detail process, which is a, a major cognitive deficit in people with eating disorders, that they can't see the bigger picture. If you give them something called the Ray Familiar Figures task, which is a, a very um, well-known way of measuring global thinking, uh, you give people a sh short period of time to, um, uh, you show them a, a complex figure, uh, and then you take it away and they have to um, um, copy, you know, you have to um, recall it, right, right, um, write it. And, and healthy controls tend to start with the bigger parts of the, the shape and then eventually go on to the smaller uh, details and they often run out of time. But people that are eating disordered types or rumination, people that are excessively ruminating, will start with those smaller details first and run out of time before they get to the bigger picture. So. So yeah, I, ho I hope that sort of answers your question uh, in a way. Thanks, uh, that makes sense to me. I hope it answers the question. Uh, and uh, we've got questions coming in <laughs> a whole lot now. Um, Kaneo has, has said uh, excellent talk and has asked uh, about going back to the framework for prediction of impulsive behavior and asks, does the reflection pathway to risk uh, behavior path D essentially overlap with the rational pathway, path E, or does reflection occur separately from rational thought? Yes, that's an excellent question, isn't it? And uh, probably um, that paper will answer the question better than me, but from my understanding of reading that paper, uh, I mean, rational thought is slightly different to reflection, isn't it, I think, because reflection um, tends to be putting yourself in, in a future perspective and deciding, you know, reflecting on, on how you've performed and then change, you know, attempting to change your behavior in the future. Whereas I suppose rational thinking is, uh, I mean, of course you need to have rational thinking for it. And, I, and I'm thinking about Kahneman and Tversky and that thinking fast and slow book, which, which is brilliant. Um, you know, where you've got the fast response uh, and then you've got the slower, more deliberative response. And uh, I think rational thinking is, is probably less to do with your own sense of self and reflection on your own performance and more, and of course, you know, they're overlapping, but more to do with, um, you, you know, will I, what will be the outcome if I if I respond in that way? I probably haven't answered that question in a very good way either. But I, can I as my colleague, so I'll, I'll continue that conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Samantha. Um, we have a question from Vicky, uh, specifically about the NBAC test. So she was asking about your use of uh, the NBAC test in your research. And she said, um, from your research on working memory, do you recommend a three or four back task? for a once of cognitive assessment. Um, and with the working memory training, for example, did you find that participants initially struggled and had much slower reaction times with the fallback? Yeah, so that's a brilliant question, something that I'm really interested in at the moment. Um, you know, encouraging people to go as high as they can on the MBAC task. Um, and so to, to answer the question, first of all, uh, when we uh, gave this task to people with, um, methamphetamine use disorder uh, in Cape Town, we only wrote the task so that it went up to fall back. And it's definitely true, obviously, um, so in the first week, let's take the first week, they completed zero back, which is just responding to an X on the screen in, on the first day, they got 100%, they have to get 80% or higher. 
to move on to the next level. So we, we wrote it so that the, pre, the, the subsequent levels will be locked until they got 80%. And once they got 80%, they could go backwards and forwards, but, um, and then when back again, they completed it quite easily on the second day. Uh, then when they got to two back on the third day, uh, there was some variance in people's ability, but generally speaking, people could do it two back. Then three back was the sort of part where people really struggled and their uh, ability really dropped. But what's very interesting is that um, after, I think, and again, I need to go back and look at the data, but um, from what I can remember, as long as they played it for the rest of the week and maybe the first couple of days of the next week, they would eventually get up to 80% on that more difficult level. And then the rest of the time, they could play four back. Uh, and four back is difficult, but, you know, and they would fluctuate, which, you know, reflects that boundary condition part of the, of the prediction of impulsivity model so um but but what was very interesting is that you couldn't um you you couldn't um leapfrog to fourth back four back straight away you just wouldn't be able to do it i mean i've had that experience myself so you have to gradually build up and, and that's why it's it really feels like you know great analogy is thinking of lifting weights at the gym that if you haven't been to the gym for a long time and you try and go back to your original weight it's really really difficult to lift it but over time if you train then you can lift greater and greater weights um so 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 yeah to answer the question about which is the best level to give to patients uh i, I would probably argue that you'd get more potency and again i'm not a clinician but from reading torkel klingberg's work he's um He's pioneered CogMed, which is the leader in the field, really. It has got flaws, but it is the leader in the field, um, in my opinion, I should say. Uh, but um, from what I saw from these meth patients, I, if I was a clinician, I'd probably start them on two back and then maybe get them up to four back and then four back would probably be fine. But if they can do higher than four back, I mean, that hasn't really been done in the literature yet, you know, that people have been encouraged to go higher and higher to see what effects it has on their behaviour. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, that, uh, it raises a really interesting question about uh, working memory training. And of course, the whole design of the training, which is tricky because yeah. you, it has to be challenge, not, you know, not too easy, challenging, but not too challenging that people just, you know, want to give up. And of course, um, a whole lot of discipline is involved in sticking to the program or incentives or both. So there's a whole lot of other factors that, that come into play. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, that was one of our one of the main flaws of our study, the scanning study, is that, you know, we sat and we just designed it, but we decided to only use zero back and one back for the fMRI part, which we're analyzing now. Uh, for the very reason that you know meth patients in the scanner and this was our experience of them they would press the button box to get out to go for a, uh, you know to the toilet and uh, they were very fidgety and very anxious and so if we gave them like a, a higher task in the scanner it, it, they would be moving their head all over the place and then we couldn't analyze the data um, but on the other hand zero back and one back is probably i mean we're do, trying to do some things like region of interest analyses and stuff but probably is a little bit too easy when back, uh, I would say. And then, as you said, the motivation aspect, I mean, that's why we're looking into gamifying it a bit and maybe using virtual reality uh, because people's motivation, I mean, but although that said, I was very shocked that these sort of gangster types that I met in the, in the inpatient facility, who turned out to be very nice, you know, besides what they'd done, um, <laughs> they they were very keen you know once they started to feel the effects and they really i did believe them when they said they felt more uh focused cognitively uh they were very keen to carry on you know um so so on this topic uh Sakwa has asked a question about working memory intervention and she i think you kind of addressed it but she she's asking do they need to be context specific? So she says, can a UK based in working memory intervention uh, be adapted or would, does it need special adaptation for the South African context? Maybe not so much in terms of content, but maybe frequency or number of trials, or would you say they're more generalizable in nature? 
that's a that's a brilliant question because um, a it's not really known yet, so it really opens up the the window for uh, for doing this research in in on the continent um, in Africa. And uh, I mean, I think the only um, uh, constraint really would be the instructions to you know to to tell people how to use it because obviously there's lots of different languages in South Africa in Africa. Um, but the actual task itself, you really, I mean, it's just simple, I mean, it's just letters, you know, so of, of course they are uh, English letters, but they're just, you know, symbols really, aren't they? Letters, single letters. Um, but then the, the other logistical question about delivery, I mean, that's a really interesting question because, of course, the um, decision to do three times a week, 15 minutes, it is based on a European sample, it's true. So it could be that we need less uh, in, in South Africa, we mainly more. I don't. I actually don't know. And um, uh, I mean, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I don't know how politically correct this is that I'm, what I'm about to say. So I'll just do it with caution. But you know, having works in both Sweden in the northern hemisphere, very cold. You know, six months of the year, there's not much growing. Uh, so there's not much available. You can probably see where I'm going with this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's lovely and warm, things grow. There's lots of nice uh, sugar and, uh, you know, lovely, uh, pleasant things down there. And I think that does change. I mean, I, I would say that UK is somewhere in the middle, you know, <laughs> uh, but this, uh, this um, do you need to plan ahead as much if uh, you've got everything there? You know, it's nice and warm. You, OK, if you don't, I, I mean, you know, it's you don't have to shelter from, well, of course, we do get rain in, South, in, in Cape Town. I, I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that because, uh, of course, there are lots of uh, lots of similarities. But it just makes me wonder whether the climate does change the way we need to use our cognitions, you know, and that applies to people of all races that have lived in uh, you know, South Africa for many, you know, for, for hundreds of years. So yes, I'm going to stop there just in case I, I get myself into hot water, but um, yeah. Interesting. I think it's really interesting, the whole cross-cultural application issue, you know, and, and looking at how environment ch may change uh, cognitive processing. I mean, um, I think yeah. it's a fruitful area of research. As well. I mean, just, just for example, I, I learned in, in, in Sweden that they have a word called lagom, which means you know, it's like Goldilocks, just enough. And uh, it's really ingrained into their society that you and it comes from when the Vikings used to sit round the campfire drinking mead and, you know, around the ring, you didn't, uh, you weren't greedy and take too much because then the next person in your group wouldn't have enough. And it's just this mindset of um, not just thinking about oneself, but also the community, which I think is actually something that you also have there in South Africa in terms of Ubuntu. So, yeah. So some interesting overlaps, so really interesting. So uh, perhaps a final question from me. Um, I, was, I, was, I was going to ask you, and you, you, you answered it in the last slide, but I want to check that I understood correctly, um, because I was thinking as you, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking what kind of cognitive intervention then would be used with people who have uh, restrictive or, uh, eating dis a restrictive eating disorder. Mm -hmm. um, given that their working memory is superior, <laughs> except, yeah. you know, would it be stimulus specific with food, only food type of uh, stimuli? And then you, you answered it in the end, I think you answered, uh, or I think what, what I understood you to be saying is that working memory training is going to enhance flexibility anyway. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, yes. you, you really hit something, hit on something out there because, uh, Nobody really, I, I knew of a group that was planning to do some working memory training in uh, restricting eating disorders. I met them at a conference actually, and, and they were, I was rather panicking because they were, you know, designing this study before we'd even got any, we're, we're not ready yet. But, um, you know, it's not clear. We've actually just written a, a review that we've just submitted to eating and weight disorders. Uh, just yesterday we submitted this paper, uh, and we did a, a very extensive review of working memory uh measures in in people with anorexia just to see what what the answer was currently in the field and 
at the moment, it seems like there's no, um, well, th th this is the, the thing, it's not so clear. Um, if you look at the, the answer generally, it's it roughly, I think it was 75% of studies say that there's no difference between uh, you know, health controls and anorexic patients in terms of their working memory processes. However, when you start delving into these papers, and this is what we've written in this, in this uh, review, uh, there is a gap emerging when you look at phonological versus physiospatial tasks. And um, what we also found was that uh, there is a major confound in terms of comorbidities and you know because it people with eating disorders veer between the different subtypes all the time and then secondly the medication that they're on so uh, which can change cognitive processes you know as, as we know so um so although you know a lot of people have said no we shouldn't be looking at working memory uh, in eating disorders that's not true and, and hopefully this paper will will um, help us to see that. So, and, and, and the, the thing that was interesting about this distinction between phonological versus physiospatial is that Hilda Brook, you know, who was one of the earliest uh, researchers in uh, eating disorder uh, uh, research, um, said that there's this thing called the inner voice uh, of people with anorexia, where, you know, a, a pro ana websites uh, sort of maybe touch on that. And that you have this inner voice that, um, which again touches on what uh, Cindy Bulick is doing in Karolinska, showing that there's a genetic link uh, th th that hinges on, um, th 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 there's a common genetic link between eating disorders and psychosis, you know, people with schizophrenia, uh, in the sense that um, this, uh, you know, this inability to, uh, you know, effectively, um, uh, utilize this working memory system. I've just completely lost the point I was just about to make then. I hope that when that happens. Uh, but, um, but the point that I wanted to make, because I know we're running out of time, is that it's, it's, not, um, it's not really, oh, sorry, that inner voice, that's where it was coming from. The, the thing about, you know, that, that people with psychosis also have this auditory uh, hallucination, which, which might be related to people with eating disorders. Um, but it's not clear whether if we are able to extend that, uh, um, it, that working memory capacity, whether people with anorexia will be able to hold in mind alternative strategies to their, you know, what they've, what they've chosen to self-regulate, which is uh, restricting their eating to gain control of their, of, of their emotions. So yeah, the jury's out really at the moment and it, we really want to do that. So we're actually designing some studies now and, and applying for funding to do eating disorder research in, in um, using working using this working memory intervention. But as you know, it takes forever to apply for the grants, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. Well, that's, that's so interesting because I think it would tie into your finding of um, increased volume in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the... Yeah. The anorexic group and that would tie in with the phonological loop perhaps superiority there i'm not sure but interesting avenues for future research yes yeah, so um, hopefully it's stimulated people to to you know look into this more because we need like loads more people working in this field to try and uncover unravel some of the these mysteries and we're looking forward to you talking to us again next year uh, about your new research so Thank you so much, um, Samantha, for a really fascinating talk. On behalf of everyone who attended, I uh, really enjoyed it and uh, have also a lot of uh, interesting ideas and thoughts that, um, you know, um, have emerged from your talk. So thank you and enjoy the weekend. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye.